Back in Palestine about 2,000 years ago, it was common practice for weddings to take place at night. It was also common for the bridegroom to travel with a procession to the bride's home for the celebration. In the story contained in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13, we know that it was the groom that was late. That certainly is different from what we're accustomed to. I'm not sure it's worth speculating as to why the bridegroom was late, but I can tell you on good authority that the bridegroom did not have a wristwatch. But it was a company by the name of Rolex that became the first to put a wristband on a watch. As with any new invention, it was all the rage a hundred years ago to be the owner of a wristwatch. For a century now, people have equated the Rolex company with high quality watches. For those of you who don't know about this company, suffice it to say that even second-hand Rolex watches can sell for thousands of dollars. I guess I need to make a confession. The watch I'm presently wearing says Rolex, but it's not a real Rolex. <laughs> Let me quickly tell you the story of how I came to be the owner of this phony Rolex. Thirteen years ago, I was walking down the street in New York City. I must have accidentally hit my watch against the wall because when I looked at the time, I observed that the glass face of my Citizen Quartz watch had fallen out. I looked around on the ground, but it was nowhere to be found. So I located the nearest watch repair store and asked the proprietor if he could replace the glass crystal in my watch. I mean, for a few days while I called up a Citizen dealer and tried to get a replacement, and it will cost you about $32. I wasn't going to be in New York for another couple of days. And I certainly was not proud of the fact that I'll pay $32 just to have the crystal replaced. So I told him thanks anyway, and I stepped out of the store. And as I stepped out of the store, I noticed a guy selling watches on the sidewalk. I can't exactly recall how the negotiations went. But I think I ended up paying about $12 for this Rolex watch I'm wearing. Instead of paying $32 just to replace the glass crystal, I came out about $20 ahead. If you know anything about these, there's a lot of empty space in here. It's not very dead. I guess you can lift it up and test by the weight to that kind of Timex on the inside. But apart from that single moment, I get the experience of having people think I can afford a real Rolex watch. Okay, back to the parable. I believe that there are several important themes contained in this parable. Among these, the difference between living in the light and living in darkness. The cost of procrastination and the cost of omission, and the importance of adequate preparation. You may call me a spin doctor, but I do feel some sympathy for the five bridesmaids in this parable, who, because of some minor detail in their preparations, were excluded from the wedding ceremony. I want to believe that, but for the insufficiency of oil in their lamps, these girls were decent people, and they experienced much embarrassment at letting down those who had invited them to participate in this wedding ceremony. Perhaps I sympathize with the bridesmaids because the story tells us that it was the bridegroom who was late, and also because the girls ultimately took responsibility for their error. If you've ever been late, or if you've ever messed up, you might understand why I feel sympathetic towards these girls. I suppose that someone could also point to the seeming lack of sympathy by the five wise bridesmaids. For it does seem somewhat unchristian of them not to share their oil in this apparent moment of crisis. And then to crown the story off, after the girls have fixed their error and asked to be allowed into the wedding party, someone looks at them in the face and tells them in a rather blunt style, that is, Anne Robinson, you are the weakest link. <laughs> Goodbye. But however startling this parable might seem, one moral from the story is that, in this Christian walk, individual preparation is essential. There are some things that just cannot be done for you. No matter how much your friends and your relatives pray for your salvation, without your own prayer of confession, you cannot obtain access to the kingdom of God. An ancillary point is this. We have the responsibility of telling others that preparation is essential. The dominant point, however, is that as Christians, we must be careful how we live our lives. In the remaining moments, I want to focus on 
these two groups of bridesmaids in five tiers and to point to five differences between good character and godly character. To aid your remembering of the five points of comparison, I've organized them via the acronym RAGES, R-A-G-E-S. I wish I had a better sound in word than RAGES, but with those five letters, that's the best I could come up with. I thought of GRACE, G-R-A-S-E, but you would think that I really can't spell, so let's stick with a word that at least you recognize. The first pair of comparisons that I want to make can be remembered by the letter R. The comparison here is between religion and righteousness. For God never calls his people to be religious. Instead, he calls us to be righteous. My dictionary defines the word religious as showing devotion to an acknowledged deity. While it defines righteous as acting in accordance with God's divine law. Righteous literally means right and wise. Two words brought together, right and wise. A key point here is that we can be religious without being righteous. For while an outward show of devotion can earn us the characterization of being religious, it is God himself who declares us righteous. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 verses 20 through 22, righteousness is not a result of work that we do, but of faith in the work that Jesus has done on our behalf. Paul also calls righteousness a gift from God in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. He continues in verse 18, By one act of righteousness, justification was imputed to us. That act of righteousness by which we are justified was Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And then after imputing righteousness to us, God turns around and rewards us for that righteousness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, the righteous shall go on into eternal life. You will notice throughout his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is repeatedly challenging his hearers to have a clear understanding of the difference between being religious and being righteous. According to Jesus, being religious can be little more than an act performed for the approval of others. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, the New International Version, he warns them not to do their acts of righteousness. If you notice that, little quotation marks around that phrase. Not to do their acts of righteousness before men. What are these acts of righteousness? Well, if you continue reading Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, you'll see Jesus mentioning three acts of righteousness. Matthew chapter 6. 1 through 18. The first act of righteousness is giving, and that's in verses 2 through 4 of Matthew 6. Jesus says, do not give publicly so that men will honor you, but what you give, give in secret, and the Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. On praying in verses 5 and 6, Jesus continues, do not pray in public to be seen by men, but go into your room and shut the door. Again, it is the Father who knows the secrets of your heart. And finally, on fasting, Jesus says in verses 16 through 18, do not look somber and disfigure your faces with ashes to show men that you're fasting. Only the Father needs to know, for he is the one who rewards your acts of righteousness. First John chapter 1, verse 18 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us but he will also cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is, he will give us his righteousness. My second point of comparison can be remembered by the letter A. And here I make the comparison between acknowledgement and allegiance. The word acknowledge means to recognize the authority or status of something or someone. By a recognition of who God is, many of us can thus be said to acknowledge him. I should say that I'm using the word acknowledge in the present day sense here because I also acknowledge that there's a biblical usage of the word acknowledge found in my favorite verse, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. The current usage of the word acknowledge, though, hardly suggests devotion. Allegiance, on the other hand, does connote devotion. Allegiance is defined as the quality of being faithful to someone to whom one is bound. It comes from an old French word which meant having an obligation to one's Lord. Beyond the mere knowledge of God, we 
as Christians are called to obedience, that is to act in conformity with this knowledge that we have of who God is and what his will for our lives is. Some people who are aware that the Bible says, call unto me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee, only turn to God during periods of trouble. Many people who are aware that the Bible's standard for upright conduct is very high would turn to the Word of God mainly for moral enlightenment. While the knowledge of what the Bible says might get us some kudos from others, it is our obedience to God's perfect will that gets us the identification from God himself of being wise in his eyes. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, He who hears my words and does what I say shall be likened unto a wise man. And he who hears and does not obey is a foolish man. Let us seek to be wise in the eyes of God. That requires a declaration of obedience or allegiance to God on our part. A third set of characteristics for comparison can be recalled by the letter G. Goodness versus godliness. Most of us like the idea that others who know us would characterize us as good people. A dictionary defines a good person as one who conforms to moral order and is a favorable character. I underscore the words conforms and favorable in this definition, since we can only make judgments based on what people want to show us about themselves. On the basis of what I have just said, it ought to be clear that our goodness as judged by others need not equate to godliness. What is godliness? Literally, God-likeness. It is a genuine reverence toward God which governs our attitude towards all aspects of life, not only our devotion to service, but our devotion to worship. Because man looks at the outward appearance, the world may deem us to be good by observing our words and our deeds, but God looks and sees whether our heart is pure. In Psalm 24, verse 3, David asked the question, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He answers in verse 4, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. God has called us to a higher calling, purity of heart. In establishing the eight-step ladder of virtues found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, the apostle Peter offers goodness as the second rung of this ladder and godliness as the sixth rung of this ladder. Godliness is indeed a higher calling. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, the apostle then exhorts us to live holy and godly lives. That is, he ranks holiness next to godliness. The songwriter Johnson Oatman calls holiness higher ground in his song, which says, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Thomas Christian expresses his desire for godliness in song number 600 in 23, where he says, Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of life's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. The author of Chorus number 107 writes, To be like Jesus. This hope possesses me in every thought and the deed. This is my aim and my creed. Dear Christians, let us strive be like Jesus. Let us strive after godliness. My fourth point of comparison can be recalled by the letter E. Enthusiasm versus endurance. Enthusiasm is defined as strong excitement of feeling. You may also know another word for enthusiasm, passion. As a teacher, I well understand the importance of enthusiasm in stirring the interest of my students. Enthusiasm can be a great aid to teaching but I well know that enthusiasm is not substance. We've all met some enthusiastic speakers who have very little to say. Endurance, on the other hand, is the ability to stay the course, to remain firm under suffering without yielding or giving in. Endurance comes from two Latin words and literally means to harden within. Through the letter of the apostle Paul, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, we are enjoined to endure hardship as good soldiers of Christ Jesus. And later in that chapter, Paul points to the promise of God that if we endure, we will reign with Christ. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. In James chapter 1, verse 12, our Lord's brother writes, Blessed is the man who perseveres, or as the King James Version says, endures under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to them who love him. All too often as life progresses and the cares of this world bear down upon us, the lamps of our early Christian zeal flicker, or like the lamps of the five bridesmaids in our parable today, they may even go out. We must guard against becoming so absorbed in the things of this world that we forget who we are, whose we are, and where we are going. Our Lord Jesus exhorts us to let our lights shine so that God may be glorified. Perhaps someone here today has a light that is about to go out. Christian friend, please, don't let this happen. Let us trim that feeble lamp because someone else might need your light to lead them to God. If your spiritual enthusiasm is fading, I say please don't be ashamed to tell some dear Christian brother or sister of your need to acquire some oil. If you say something like, I feel my lamp is growing dim, I'm sure that there's someone right here today who can be of assistance to you in helping you to get the oil in your lamp to keep you burning at least until the break of day. And if you are aware of that person whose spiritual light is fading, be sure to offer some oil of encouragement. The light that is their faith needs to be brought back to its original full being. Remember that as Philip Bliss says in song number 478, it is God who gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. He gives us that charge. He is the greater light and we are the lesser light. He is the light that draws them in and we are the light that leads them to the shore so that they can reach safely. That is our charge. Remember, we as Christians are called to bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. I pray that our spiritual lights will keep on burning because as Philip Bliss continues in verse 3 of song number 478, some poor sailor tempest tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. So let our lower lights be burning. We've now arrived at our last set of characteristics for comparison, and these can be recalled by the letter X. Sentimentality versus sacrifice. Sentimentality is the state or quality of being sentimental, especially to excess. Surely God has endowed us with the emotion to be sentimental, that is, to feel or to sense. But what is sentiment really worth? It might be good to be sentimental over someone else's situations or even our own situations. But a major problem I feel with sentimentality is that we feel for a time and then we forget. Feelings do fade. One of the biggest dangers with feelings is that they can often deceive us. Some people get into terrible rages over feelings and destroy in very short order reputations and relationships that they've established over many long years. For reasons such as this, we need to have something less fickle than feeling. And this is why Lucy Booth Helberg enjoins us in song number 773 to live above feeling. One way to live above feeling is to devote ourselves sacrificially to God. For God has not called us to lives of sentimentality, but to lives of sacrifice. Sacrifice. It's the product of two Latin words which together mean to make holy. If we are truly sentimental about what God has done for us through Jesus' sacrifice, shouldn't we offer some sacrifice to prove our sentiment is sincere? To demonstrate the devotion of her love to God, Ruth Tracy says in song number 507, but since love's value is proved by love's test, Jesus, I'll give you the dearest and best. In making a sacrificial offering of her life to God, Mary James writes in song number 511, my body, soul, and spirit. Jesus, I give to thee a consecrated offering thine evermore to thee. Friends, these ten characteristics that we have just examined represent the comparison between good and godly lives. The differences are frequently not observable by the world, but they are always observable by God. People of good character should protect not only their reputations and their influence, but they should seek to make sure that God is pleased with the lives they are living. Sometimes, when we look at 
passages like the one that we focused on today, we get a sense of despair. We get a sense of dejection because we're thinking, will God exclude us for some small error like forgetting to bring spare vessels of oil in case he tarries? Perhaps this passage has very good shock value. I'm not saying that in a, a way that I want to shock you, but I'm saying this to say that perhaps the harshness of this parable is because the truth needs to be spoken bluntly. And the blunt truth is that it is not enough as Christians to strive to be people of good character. We must strive after godly character. The difference between the two is what I believe the Bible calls a sin of omission. And this is the one thing that keeps us from the joy of the Lord, from having that joy ever present in our lives. It was the sin of omission that kept the five bridesmaids out of the wedding ceremony. Likewise, the sin of omission can break the joyful connection that we have with our Lord Jesus and leave us feeling hollow on the inside, while appearing to others to be complete on the outside. While no one around us might be able to tell whether we are phony Rolex watches, whether we are Rolex watches on the outside and Timex watches on the inside, I remind you the great watchmaker knows. And if we ask him, he has promised to freely replace that phony mechanism on the inside with the real thing. How can you resist something that good, especially when it's that free? I trust that you will let him do this in your life today. Because he is able and he is willing to do that much and more.